Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com Also on Alan Watt Sentient Sentinel dot EU on July the 18th, 2007 Today people are so overwhelmed with the amount of information and disinformation and just sheer data they don't know what to make of it all they often end up in a, a bigger confusion than the one they they started with chasing rainbows false leads and they're trying to make sense because the human mind each individual has a logic which depends upon incoming data in order to try and figure out its immediate environment and the bigger environment beyond every creature that lives tries to change and it must change its immediate environment in order to survive from insects all the way up and even from amoebas in fact all the way up that's a natural thing so we tend for survival's sake instinctively to need to know our immediate environment this has always been understood by those who gather sciences and the data concerning the public the general masses as they call them when you can understand this concept you can also interfere with it if you have power you can encourage each individual at the bottom level to be completely concerned with their immediate environment their little area their home their area their people around them their town everything they need immediately for day-to-day survival you encourage that and you can cut them off from bigger realities beyond by either giving them false data concerning the big picture of the world in general or even their country you simply withhold data and you encourage the trivia that's what most television stations your local television stations are all about that's their job is to make you think everything you need to know and worry about and care about is just around you and that used to be true at one time to a great extent not completely though because there's always ones from outside that area that would come and invade you for for and steal what you had uh, since the advent of money especially because money was necessary to get standing armies in the first place and hold them together long enough to go and invade somewhere far away for over a hundred years we've had at least the public have been given forms of communication from telephone then radio and television followed up long before this was decided to be given to the public it was debated at very high levels whether the public should have it in the first place and if they did get it what real purpose would it be to serve the system's elite themselves because nothing is given to the public that might upset the system therefore all information that was decided long ago would be vetted and given out to the public censored if you like debated and censored what would fill your head at the bottom would literally be decided at very high levels your topics of conversation the dramas that happen in everyday life that end in murders the things that grasp people's attention the intrigue uh, should they give them that or should they give them 
false data concerning government, and that was a big one from the very beginning. You never let the public know what government's really all about, since it's there to serve an elite and democracy being a complete farce to begin with. We live in an ongoing, long-term business plan. Very, very old agenda. The techniques are exactly the same, except the technologies that convey information have altered, but the same techniques are used, even with these technologies. Long ago it was decided that to control a whole world completely, I mean complete control of every individual, you need everyone to be completely predictable. That meant complete personality profiling, the collection of every individual's data on an in, on a daily basis in fact and how on earth this could be achieved and they knew they would give us a, a technique eventually where you couldn't buy or sell without it being monitored your income would be monitored your output would be monitored and that agenda has never let up When you look at Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, a fictional story written in the 1500s, published in 1602, concerning a future society uh, which would have its headquarters in the West. They meant America, of course. They call it Solomon's Island, run on virtue and uh, a secret society running the whole show comprised of high intellectuals and scientists. There's no way that Bacon could have imagined a society which powered itself with a, an energy which could give off the light of the sun. That's very familiar, isn't it? If we think of nuclear energy. And people think, so that's impossible, he couldn't have imagined that. Well, he couldn't have imagined that, you're quite right. In the days of wind sail and canvas sails and the horse and cart and a candle to write by, you could not have imagined that at all. And neither did he. But then atomic energy was speculated upon thousands of years ago. If you go into the writings of the atomist organizations in ancient Greece where these supposed intellectuals simply because they had nothing better to do but pass the time wearing their white robes and chatting away and speculating that everything was composed of these minute particles that spun around worlds within worlds called atoms which is just a play on atom by the way the microcosm everything is interrelated in this big joke the trick in all ages is to keep real high sciences, which are constantly being investigated by special teams all down through the ages, secret from the public. To have ultimate control, you could never ever share all your high knowledge, because sharing power means you lose power if you want to be dominant. Yet, there's no doubt that Francis Bacon's book was published at that time. Not the updated versions that spin in the aliens and all that kind of stuff. That's uh, the, the New Age spin that the elite have uh, promoted to confuse us even further. Because it's much easier to believe your, the game is over if uh, aliens are superior to you run the whole world and always have that's called psychological warfare the purpose being that you give up before anything starts the actual original New Atlantis was written along with other books like Moore's book on his utopia 
All along the same lines of this elitist, utopic society uh, run by the intellectuals, those who had the right to, to rule the rest by their vast intellectual powers. This was all involved in the 1600s with the Rosicrucian Society that eventually branched out into other organizations because you have a pyramid scheme and just like the monks in times gone by the monasteries would would start up for one particular purpose and then spawn a, a, a sister organization with another specialized purpose well that's the pyramid you see same technique down through the ages and libraries, always libraries and specialized groups investigating the sciences all sciences that's why it's astounding when to the public when someone comes out with incredible statements on the future sometimes they use authors like H.G. Wells today there's a whole bunch of them being put out there to give us predictive programming the idea being that if we accept it subconsciously as a possibility then they can guide you with possibility upon possibility and then what becomes reality you think is a natural evolution but there's nothing of the kind it's planned that way in advance and as predictive programming as it's called yet once in a while the elite in Britain this elite being a very very old elite they're called the establishment they're there regardless of what party yells at each other across the parliamentary floor the elite decide what's to be done they pick the top politicians doesn't matter about the ones down below they're allowed to compete for the little share in the booty of the public purse and fame and glory and high contracts when they leave for lobbyists jobs but the ones at the top are always picked in advance and groomed before the public even hear their names as long as the top cabinet belong to the Royal Institute then everything's hunky-dory I'm going to read a, an article written in the magazine it was written in 19... 19- 20s so think about this I'll tell you at the end which one it is and where to find it on the cover you'll see a young British lord that couldn't have been more than 22 with his big long braided wig on because all the House of Lords, the guys who are, have hereditary peerships, wear these long wigs and they get their robes with the ermine and they dress like something from the, the 1700s. But no one's ever explained the purpose of these particular wigs, but if you count the curls going all up and, up and down, you'll see the degrees. And is it this young, arrogant face, as they all do? looking very solemn and stern and uh, arrogant and all-knowing. This is Lord Birkenhead. And this is what he says. And he says all of the following because he's allowed into a higher circle of science which already existed at least the basics of it did, did, and he was let in on the know. The ones at the bottom that the public hear about are doing research they don't know about the findings of those above them done long ago. It's from February 1929. Babies will be produced by chemists in laboratories. He's talking about the year 2029. The entire institution of marriage will be changed. 
we will all live to be 150. No one will need to work more than two hours a day. Agriculture will be abolished, except as a hobby, and all foodstuffs will be produced synthetically. Man will be able to alter the geography or climate of the world. Think about that. Coal mining will be an extinct industry. A 48-hour day will come into being by retarding the rotations of the earth. Sitting in our homes, we will see and hear events the world over. 1929. Now, I'm going to continue here. Now, remember, this guy isn't sitting with a crystal ball. He's not channeling. He doesn't have a medium next to him from uh, who's channeling Zeta Reticuli or some faraway place. So here's the, the story. A century hence, it appears probable that the application of scientific discoveries will have altered the conditions of human life at least as much as they've done in the past hundred years. A child born in 1829 arrived in a world that was just beginning to exploit the steam engine, in which electricity was the useless byway of a few professors, where anesthetics and antiseptics were unknown. A child of 2029 looking back on 1929 will consider it as primitive and quaint as 1829 seems to the children of the present day. Our means of travel, our sources of wealth, our medicine, and even our ideas will change as drastically during the next century as it did in the course of the last. Applied physics, which has given us a steam engine, the internal combustion motor, as well as wireless telephones and all the many other practical uses of electrical energy, will certainly make prodigious advances before the year 2029. At the moment, however, the theoretical basis of physics rests in an undetermined state. Physics is on the brink of a new synthesis, a fresh simplification and restatement of fundamental ideas. This, when it comes, and it cannot long be delayed, must radically change all our assumptions concerning time, space, and the nature of change. Such a revolution of ideas must be accounted among the most important effects of science upon human life in the next century. But it is, of course, very difficult to predict what direction this change of ideas will take. Until another Newton restates physical theory, one cannot determine how his restatement will react upon the everyday world. It is easier to prophesy concerning the material changes which will be wrought by applied physics in the next hundred years. The best scientific opinion believes that before 2029, physicists will have solved the problem of supplying the world with limitless amounts of cheap power. At present we derive the energy which drives the wheels of industry from coal and oil. Both these substances are won from nature at the expense of much money and vast stores of muscular energy, nor are their supplies inexhaustible. By means of the most efficient methods, however, a pound of coal can only be made to yield energy of the order of one horsepower for one hour. Yet locked up in the atoms which constitute a pound of water, there is an amount of energy equivalent to ten million horsepower hours. There is no question that this colossal source of energy exists, but as yet physicists do not know how to release it, or having done so, how to make it perform useful work. This problem will be solved before 2029. Some investigator, at present in his cradle or unborn, will discover the match with which to light this bonfire or the detonator needed to cause this terrific explosion. 
the consequences of tapping such stupendous sources of cheap energy are almost illimitable. For the first time in history, man will be armed with sufficient power to undertake operations on a cosmic scale. It will be open to him radically to alter the geography or the climate of the world. By utilizing some 50,000 tons of water, the amount displaced by a large liner, it would be possible to remove Ireland to the deeper portion of the Atlantic Ocean. The heat obtainable from the same quantity of water would suffice to maintain the polar regions at the temperature of the Sahara for a thousand years. Think about it. The liberation of this energy naturally will revolutionize travel and transport. Engines weighing one ounce for each horsepower they develop will become practical possibilities and a power plant of 600 horsepower will carry fuel for a thousand hours working in a tank no bigger than a fountain pen. Concerning the nature of the vehicle for which such engines will provide the motive power, it is rash to prophesy. Passengers will travel in enormously swift aeroplanes, which by 2029 will ascend and descend vertically. Goods will be carried cheaply and rapidly by land or sea, propelled by motors whose fuel bill will be almost nil. The coming of this new energy obviously will be accompanied by acute social problems. Its adaptation to industry will entail, for example, the final extinction of coal mining. Since, however, it cannot but vastly reduce the cost of all manufacturers, there is hope that the new wealth it creates will enable governments adequately to provide for the millions whose livelihood it destroys. Some authoritative scientists do not believe that the solution of the power problem will be reached along these lines. They consider that either the the winds or the tides will be forced to yield up their energy. Water power is too unevenly distributed over the air service and too much affected by seasonal variations ever to become the principal source of the world's energy. But the winds are never still, and the tides flow and ebb with unvarying precision. If the winds were harnessed, they could produce a superabundance of cheap power. During stormy weather, their surplus energy could be stored in a variety of ways and so be available during calms. I'll break for a second here to tell you that this character, you see, this Lord, had been given access to a future already decided upon. The reason being he was a hereditary peer of the realm, a Lord, who gains access to the business plan. And they never change their plans. The exploitation of tidal energy presents difficulties which have yet to be solved in a satisfactory manner. These difficulties, however, are not those of principle, but of technique. And if the wealth and the serious engineering attention of the world were focused on the question for ten years, there's no doubt that they would be overcome. The tides of the Bay of Fundy alone could supply the whole of North America with electrical energy. By utilizing tidal energy to any large extent, we should diminish the speed of the Earth's rotation. As it is, the tides act as a break upon the rotation of the Earth. That's true. It, um, as we spin, you see, it's almost like a drag as it catches up and tries to catch up. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's the old theory. To continue, as it is, the tides act as a break upon the rotation of the earth. Tidal friction occurs principally in the Bering Sea, which divides Alaska from Siberia. Its present effect is negligible, since it does but lengthen the day by a fraction less than a second in the course of each century. If sufficient energy were extracted from the tides to supply every imaginable future development of human enterprise with power, this breaking effect would not be greatly increased, 
Many millions of years would elapse before the day grew as long as our present week. Five thousand years takes us back to the dawn of recorded human history, and that's his little lie, you see, because he's well aware it's much older. So that even a tenth part of one million years carries us forward beyond the reach of imagination. We need not, therefore, grow alarmed that by harnessing the tides we shall so retard the rotation of the earth as to embarrass our remotest descendants. But the 48-hour day is a possibility in the far future. During the next hundred years, applied physics will certainly develop wireless telephony and television beyond our present most imaginative expectations. By 2029, it should be possible for any person sitting at home to be present at no matter what distant event. Stereoscopic television. (laughs) This is before the public got TV, remember, even mono. In full natural colours and perfected wireless telephony will enable him to see and hear any event which is broadcast as effectively as if he stood beside the transmitting apparatus. Such developments must influence the future of politics, for by their aid it will be feasible once more to revive that form of democracy which flourished in the city-states of ancient Greece. By 2029, the chosen spokesman of each political party will be able to address every voter as effectively as he now can address the House of Commons. And so the electorate in itself, rather than its representatives, may decide each vital political issue. they got to get you a bit, of, a bit of icing on the cake to make you believe it and want to eat the cake. After the spokesman of each party has had his or her say, the votes of the entire country could be recorded and counted by mechanisms installed in the telephone exchanges. Within 20 minutes from the end of the last speech, the will of a national jury on any subject could be ascertained and announced. It's not about computer voting. Applied chemistry has not affected human life in a manner comparable with the changes produced by physical research. So far, the ordinary man is concerned. Chemistry is only useful to him when it discovers new desirable substances or discovers a means of synthesizing a material more cheaply than is produced in nature. In the past, chemists have enriched the resources of humanity with new metals and dyes, drugs, explosives, and other substances useful in industry or in private life. By 2029, thousands more such new substances will be available. Aluminium will be cheaper than pig iron is today. Malleable, unbreakable glass will be a commonplace of domestic life. It's also been suggested that chemical research will turn to the discovery of new physiologically pleasant substances At present, civilized mankind has discovered and adopted only three such substances, such as tobacco, alcohol, and caffeine. For tea and coffee, these certainly have added enormously to the amenities of existence, and Dr. J. B. S. Haldane has proposed that chemists should seriously consider a search for many more such additions to human enjoyment. Most chemical substances are either disagreeable or dangerous in their physiological effects, though a small number, not more than a few thousand, are valuable to medicine. Should chemistry in the next hundred years be able to discover a dozen substances as pleasant and harmless as tobacco, yet each producing a different effect on the consumer, it would have earned the thanks of every hard-worked man and woman in the world. They'd love to dope us all, you see. Any developments in physics and chemistry, which reasonably may be predicted to occur before 2029, do more do no more than alter the accidentals of human existence. In biology, however, developments may be predicted which will change the whole nature of life as we experience it today. Even those who know least about the confidently expect prodigious advances from medicine and surgery in the near future, and their faith will not be in vain. The abolition of epidemic disease by 2029 is fairly certain, as is the discovery of cures for such scourges as cancer and tuberculosis. 
well, that's true, they do have all the cures, just that the public will never see them. Complete and prolonged local anesthesia will become practicable so that not only will operations be painless, but the patient will feel no pain afterwards as a a result of them. Such an advance also entails completely painless childbirth. Biologists by 2029 will have learned the secrets of the living chemistry of the human body, or at least enough of it to achieve startling results. Rejuvenation will be an ordinary and well-recognized matter of a few injections at appropriate intervals. Now, when were they actually using these little injections? Certainly not for you boys and girls, I can assure you that. The desire to keep old age at bay has never, has ever been one of the dreams of humanity. At last we can predict that it will be achieved. This mortal must put on immortality by extending the length of his days on earth. The attraction of such an idea, especially to women, <laughs> who will no longer grow old quickly, is far too clear to require emphasis but the universal practice of rejuvenation will be accompanied by grave social problems, the least of which would be the immense increase in population. Suppose it possible to guarantee 150 years of life to every healthy child, how will youths of 20 be able to compete in the professions or in business or against vigorous men still in their prime at 120 with a century of experience on which to draw the benefits to humanity which will accrue if the lives of men of genius are so prolonged is obvious. Before 2029, biologists will have solved some of the mysteries of human hereditary. Heredity. Heredity is determined by certain genes or units concerning which science already knows much. Their minute body is so small that if a hen's egg were magnified to the size of the world, one of the genes in it would lie on a fair-sized dining table. When biologists can control these, they will be able to control heredity. Now, this is remembered 1929. You know, before they discovered a lot of stuff and all that. Most probably, by 2029, a clever young man will consider his fiancée's hereditary complexion before proposing marriage. It's not about eugenics here. And the young woman of that day will refuse him because he has inherited a gene from his father which will predispose their children to quarrelsomeness. Quarrelsomeness. He's talking about behavior, you see, personal behavior. It's interesting he doesn't touch on the physical disability part of it. But these guys are eugenicists, you see. This is the elite talking here. By intelligent combinations of suitable genes, it will be possible to predict with a reasonable certainty that truly brilliant children shall be born of a marriage. That's called in genetic enhancement today. They had that term back then, but we didn't know about that. You see, we were kept in the dark. Uh, he's talking in the days of the, you know, the dirigible balloon and the biplane. He's talking about taking out the, you know, the bad genes, the inferior types that make me make you quarrelsome or disobedient to your superiors. That's what he's talking about. It was all discussed even before this guy was born. This writing this. It is possible, however, that by 2029 the whole question of human heredity and eugenics will be swallowed up by the prospect of ectogenic birth. By this is meant the development of a child from a fertilized cell outside its mother's body in a glass vessel filled with serum on a laboratory bench. Such a proceeding is neither incredible nor, indeed, remotely remote. The results of much research show that the connection between a mother and her growing child are purely chemical. There is no valid reason why one day biologists could not be able to perfectly to imitate that chemical connection in the laboratory. And so you'll, what it means really is you'll, you'll be born and immediately you go ga 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 and start trying to cuddle 
your petri dish is your mother or the bench you're on. Yeah, because you see this love bonding stuff is just, you know, it's all nonsense. It's purely chemical. Uh, but this was all decided long, long before the public heard about the little tidbits that were given from the 60s onwards as though it was a brand new idea. And here's this guy in 1929 writing about it because he didn't come up with this either. He was let in on the know. It was all decided in the previous century. You know, the 1800s. The possibility of ectogenic children will naturally arouse the fiercest antagonism. Religious bodies of many different creeds will rally their adherents to fight such a fundamental biological invention. In fact, the mere mention of its possibility here may strike many readers as gratuitously disgusting. Nevertheless, the thing is possible, and since it is possible, it is certain that scientists will be deterred by no persecution from straining after it. See, all, all the reactions of the public are already figured out in advance and overcome when they announce these things even. All the deba- debating, all the problems they, they foresee are debated and overcome before they tell us any of this stuff. Then retell us later on as though it's brand new again. Should ectogenesis ever become an established part of human society, its effects will be shattering. Primarily, it will separate reproduction from marriage, and the latter institution will become wholly changed. Further, the character of the future inhabitants of any state could be determined by the government which happened temporarily to enjoy power. Now remember, too, this character is the same age group as the Aldo Huxleys that wrote Brave New World in the 1930s. You see, they all knew this stuff because they were in on the know. All the stuff they're talking about had already been done secretly a long time ago. Further, the character of the future inhabitants of any state could be determined by the government. Further, I'll say that again, the character of the future inhabitants of any state could be determined by the government, which happened temporarily to enjoy power by regulating the choice of the ectogenic parents of the next generation. The captain of the future could breed a nation of industrial dullards, that means morons, folks, or leaven the population with 50,000 charmingly irresponsible mural painters. This is a little high-class joke, chuckle, chuckle. A further immediate consequence of ectogenesis would be a plea that society should be allowed to produce the human types it most needs instead of being forced to absorb all the unsuitable types which happen to be born. Eugenics again and the planned society. Long, arranged long ago, long before we were even born or your parents were born. If it were possible to breed a race of strong, healthy creatures intelligent to perform intricate drudgery yet lacking all ambition what ruling class would resist the temptation many of the arguments brought against slavery would be powerless in such a case for the ectogenic slave of the future would not feel his bonds every impulse which makes slavery degrading and irksome to ordinary humanity would be removed from his mental equipment he wouldn't he wouldn't care his only happiness would be in his task. He would be the exact human counterpart of the worker bee. Oh, where have we heard that before? Going all the way back to ancient Egypt. Hmm. Ah, boy, ah, boy. As above, so below, eh? Hmm. Only the, the arguments of religion could be used to prevent his evolution. Evolution. Here we go. His emancipation could never be considered, for in freedom he would find only crushing boredom and misery. I gotta work, I gotta work, I gotta just work a hundred hours a week, I just have to do it, I just have to do it, to make me happy. It seems improbable, however, that the future developments of industry will call for such a being to tend its wheels. Production will become so cheap 
and barring political or international upheavals, wealth will accumulate to such an extent that the ectogenetic robot, a robot, hmm, will never be needed. So the human's now an, a robot. He's a golem. G-O-L-E-M. It is far more likely that men will work as machine minders for one or two hours a day and be free to devote the rest of their energies to whatever form of activity they enjoy. Such a condition obviously presupposes that all drudgery, not only the drudgery of the coal mine and the machine shop, will be abolished by science. It predicates the end of agriculture as the fundamental industry upon which human life rests. Think about that now. Probably biology, in alliance with chemistry, will make an end of agriculture even sooner than the cheapening of production will render a 10-hour maximum week universal in the workshops of the world. By 2029, agriculture if not abolished, will be in decay, at least in civilized lands. They knew that back then, you see, and long before. The first step towards the end of agriculture will be the production of benevolent bacteria, (laughs) able to fix the atmospheric nitrogen, which is essential to the growth of plant plant life. Such bacilli never could develop naturally since many of their ancestors will be unable to live except under entirely artificial conditions in a laboratory. But when the active nitrogen-fixing bacteria are at last hardened off and allowed to multiply in agricultural land, their immediate effect will be to act as a super-efficient manure. By their aid, five or even ten years of wheat will grow where one grows now, while the pasture which now feeds ten beasts, will feed fifty. Such a development will, of course, be watched with anxious eyes by all governments. Food prices will slump. Millions of laborers all over the world will find their livelihood vanished. Hard on the heels of this development will come the perfection of synthetic foodstuffs. At present, we nourish ourselves by a curiously wasteful and roundabout method. Solar energy is absorbed by plants and stored by them in their structures, mainly in the form of cellulose. The human body is unable to digest cellulose and so to extract nourishment from it. Many animals, however, aided by obliging bacteria, are able to perform this feat, and we keep herds of sheep, cattle and pigs all engaged in the task of digesting cellulose and transforming it into the meat and milk upon which we live. Already it is impossible to convert indigestible cellulose into digestible sugar, but as yet the cost of the operation prevents its being carried out except as a laboratory experiment. Such processes as this will certainly be further investigated and developed, so that by 2029, Starch and sugar, two of her most valuable foods, will be as cheap as sand or sawdust today. Concerning proteins, the other most important human foods, two possibilities exist. Either they too will be produced synthetically, or else the more highly prized varieties of animal foods, such, for example, as beefsteak or chicken's breast, will be grown in suitable media in the laboratory. From one parent's steak of choice, tenderness, it will be possible to grow as large and as juicy a steak as can be desired, so long as the parent is supplied with the correct chemical nourishment. It will continue to grow indefinitely and perhaps eternally. Whenever it is sufficiently large, a few pounds can be cut from it and sent to market. Synthetic foods and the production of animal tissues in vitro will finally set at rest those tissues of those timid minds which prophesy a day when the earth's resources will not feed her children. Though all the inhabitable surface of the globe were inconveniently crowded, the millions of mankind could still be fed to repletion by such means. This second revolution in food production will consummate the decay of agriculture, which can only survive as a rich man's hobby. 
Probably, however, the synthetic foods of the next century will be so much more easily digested and appetizing that their present equivalents that agriculture will survive only in historical romances. Since the beginnings of history, the city has been the parasite of the countryside. Boy, he's right there. In 2029, science will make the city a self-supporting unit. And Britain, a land of laboratories capable of feeding no matter how many millions of mouths without importing a ton of foodstuffs. Many will bewail such a prospect, for they insist that a flourishing agricultural peasantry is the only sound basis of any political life. It will be necessary, when agriculture goes into irrevocable decay, to plan the evolution of a stable industrial society. Such an undertaking should not lie beyond human wit. The agricultural basis of society which has existed for so many centuries was itself evolved from nomads and savages. To reconcile such folk with the peaceful static life of the husbandsman needed for a far more violent adjustment than will be necessary to urbanize the descendants of the world's present agriculturists. It's conceivable that not all these changes will have occurred by 2029. The progress of scientific discovery is checkered and subject to no ascertainable regularity or period. In many instances, an applied science after a few years of violent progress stagnates, or at best is advanced by small refinements and simplifications. The history of the locomotive steam engine provides an illustration During the last half century, railway trains have grown steadily longer and heavier. In consequence, larger and more powerful engines have been evolved to draw them to their destinations, but the huge locomotive of today differs only in size and power from its parent of the 1860s and 1870s. No new principle of any importance has been introduced into its design or construction. A similar stagnation may overtake the development of airplanes or of wireless telephony. Such halts in the progress of any applied science, however, are comparative and not final. A fresh mind produces a new idea or a simplification which inaugurates another period of rapid and sweeping activity. I have assumed, therefore, that the rate of progress in applied physics, chemistry and biology during the next hundred years will be maintained approximately at its present level. It may even be greatly accelerated by the ever-increasing interest in scientific research on the part of industrialists and governments. Nevertheless, unless science is able to change our ideas no less rapidly than our environment, some of the developments at which I have hinted may not, may not come to pass. Unless, for example, the ideas of Asiatic peoples are drastically changed, it will be impossible to stamp out epidemic disease from the world. But it is not self-evident that all applications of scientific discovery deserve the support of intelligent men and women. Because science has benefited humanity in the past, there is no reason why it always should do so in the future. A biological discovery may well plunge the world into such a catastrophe as would destroy civilization for a thousand years. As you are reading these words, some disinterested researcher may detonate an atomic explosion which will involve the world and reduce it to a flaring vortex of incandescent gas. So there you have that one. And that is from the Cosmopolitan magazine, February 1929, when it was owned by Randolph Hearst. And this little talk on a future with much of what we're seeing happen today and much of this information re-released in the 1960s and onwards as though it was brand new it was written in 2029 by Lord Birkenhead of England one of those in the know, and you'll see his photograph 
on the page, the first page of his talk in the magazine, with his big wig on and all his curls of his artificial rug that he wears, and the arrogant upper class facial appearance that he puts on there. I think they must practice that from birth. And a little emblem of Saturn in the left. Old Kronos that eats her children or his children. And then you have two lightning bolts behind him which turned out eventually to be the sign one of the symbols of the Nazis. Ooh, what does it all have in common? I do wonder. Yep, science is not new. All the things we're told about are obsolete. All the stuff that we use is obsolete. And, in fact, before you get any of it, there are massive debates at very high levels as to whether they should give it to the public. And there's always an ulterior purpose in doing so. It was we snap up all the goodies and say, my goodness, isn't this fun, fun, fun? I can play longer and more. And yet we're all being brought into a catch-22 where we can't think for ourselves anymore because it's all done for us. And many people in today's world are quite happy with that arrangement. They haven't consciously thought it through. In fact, most people, and it's, it's true, don't really consciously think much through at all. Their ideas are marketed to them and downloaded into them as efficiently as a program is downloaded into the computer because essentially we are just walking computers in a sense. You can also detect the double speak of Lord Birkenhead as he talks about methods of controlling the population growth. On the other hand, he talks about millions of people being able to eat because they could easily synthesize foods. The double speak, he didn't want to panic the general herd too quickly. He left that to his later offspring and relatives who've been drumming the drums since about the 60s onwards about crisis, crisis, too many people. My goodness, what shall we do? And hence all the abortion clinics opened up all over the place. And free sex was promoted, free love, in order to create the problem, to give the solution, and they need more abortion clinics and legalize it all. And before you know it, a fetus, which is a baby, is just a wart, and you can get rid of that, can't you? There's nothing happens in society that isn't planned long ago, debated long ago, by those who already ruled the world and ruled this system, this one financial system of commerce and working and laboring and buying and selling that we are all taught to grow up and compete in. When he gave the speech, of course, the agriculturists couldn't really picture been out of work, like it was, ha ha, that's silly, we'll always be rearing these cows here, and uh, no, we won't, we've already seen the agribusinesses being promoted, these big foundations and and businesses that, that have buildings opposite every capital of the world, and they, they lobby all the politicians, most of them either having been politicians themselves, or they will be after they leave their CEO's position back into politics, back and forth like ping-pong balls, because we're under this corporate fascist or fascistic system already, and we have been really all our lives. The purpose of life has never been discussed by the ordinary people. We have never had a say in anything, to be honest with you. Even when we think we're winning a little bit and getting a little bit more of the material world, the goodies, even the things you need to survive as a temporary respite, as they're already designing the plug to be pulled a little further down the road, 
so they, it's the Lord give us, the Lord take us away. Lords like Lord Birkenhead. If you're allowed to clear land and create a farm with hard work and sweat and tears, it's all right because once you've done it, they'll simply tax it from you till you're off the land or put you out with massive fines because you can't keep up with the ever-increasing standards, building standards and codes and land codes, etc. So yeah, two or three generations down the road, they can take it back from you and you've created some real estate and the big agribusinesses move in and say thank you very much for all that hard work. Now it's ours for peanuts. Remember, the releases of this Burke and Head are just the same kind of releases of uh, Francis Bacon or Moore in Utopia and many others who had been given inside information from higher sciences not from the professors down, but much higher up, with it already being, they'd been investigating many different areas to do with everything we, we now think they're investigating today. <laughs> it's all been done a long, long time ago. And that's why they call it research, research. At the bottom level, they don't know that it's all been done before by much higher levels that are kept secret from everyone except those at the top. That's how power really is. It doesn't share itself. It gives you an an illusion, occasionally, of having choices. But in reality, all the decisions were made a a long time ago with, with your betters. You know, these people who are your betters, because, well, they have better genes than you, you see. They're not Levi's. They're good genes, better ones old genes that are mated up with other good genes. So these genes last a long while before they wear out, obviously, and are still here today as they mate each other up and marry their power and add to power and money. And, of course, the psychopathic trait of the gene that they have is passed on to their offspring They're not as silly as people would like to make out. They have a natural instinct for power and control and dominating others. Sometimes with the most pleasant faces, another gift of the psychopath. And always depending on the fact that ordinary, normal people with empathy, with consciences, will believe them, whatever they say, because we cannot believe, being ordinary people with empathy, that there are such evil, cruel people who would do the most horrific things to not just us, but anyone across the planet, because the end justifies the means, and they sleep well at night. That's why they get away with it. They start wars, they continue wars, they profit from wars. the structure of society is held together by natural laws which are well understood and exploited by those that know the sciences. Formulas that worked thousands of years ago are reapplied in the same sequence, always with the same result with the populations. We believe what we're told, we do what we're told, And then we look towards these benefactors at the top, these superior people, to take care of us. And many people like it that way, when they're reared in this socialistic system of expert rule, scientific rule. We have more time to go and play. Well, these weighty decisions are all made for us by the superior ones above us were well managed and dictated to from cradle to grave 
and it's getting worse all the time. As each department above us of bureaucracy shows their teeth and shows their power with more and more powers being demanded over the public and we know the deafening silence of the public, the majority of them, each time the laws are passed. This is a battle for the heart and soul and the mind and the right to decide a future for ourselves. Where do you stand on this? For myself and Hamish, it's good night. And may your God or your gods go with you. To help carry on our important work, I want you to join the Secret Squadron. Catch your breath, but it's all.